All right, you delicious bastards, here we are again. Review of Episode 2 of Halt and Catch Fire's first season. A lot of reviewers felt the second episode is where Halt and Catch Fire loses its edge. I think it's where it swings into magnificent stride. In the last episode, Joe showed himself to be a man out of his depth, and in this episode, you see just how outmatched and blindsided he is by two people he never saw coming. Honey badger lifts the face of the puppet master, chews it up like a honey master, spits it on a tea of copy pasta, the honey badger. Let's go through the characters really quick. This is Joe. He's the domineering, possibly sociopathic technological visionary. Here's Gordon, the meek engineering genius. John Bosworth, or Boz, the VP of sales for Cardiff. Nathan Cardiff, the mostly absentee owner of Cardiff Electric. Dale, IBM's VP of sales for North America. And of course, Cameron. She's a programmer prodigy. She also likes to rape people, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Last time we had a whole bunch of IBM lawyers marching through Cardiff Electric's office. If you don't know why, it's because Joe and Gordon reverse engineered an IBM BIOS. Joe then called IBM in a gambit to force Cardiff Electric into the personal computer market. To avoid being sued by Big Blue, everyone involved has to exploit a legal loophole by pretending that Cardiff intended to create a compatible clone of IBM's machine all along. <sighs> This involves our intrepid duo bluffing said goon squad of IBM lawyers. Oh, and her too. Here's where things get interesting, though. Dale, no lawyers. Why? I know what you're going to say. You tell the boys at Boca Raton they've written a nice BIOS here. It'll be tough to beat. But rest assured, ours will contain no copyrighted material. Cameron Howe will be completely isolated in a clean room environment. She'll have no contact with Gordon Clark or his reverse engineering work. Any similarities in the code will be completely coincidental. You know the legal loophole as well as I do. Honestly, I don't care. I'm more interested in where the hell you've been the last year and a half. You left without saying goodbye. Ooh, someone's battleship just got sunk. This is the one point where Dale manages to shut Joe up. And it's a fake pout over Joe not telling him goodbye. See that face? Told any of your new friends about that day? That face says, you know what you did. I don't know what Dale did, though. But I wish I did, because it seems like it would be really insightful to why Joe busted up a water main and... and flooded a data center in IBM and then disappeared for a year and a half and everybody thought he was dead. And if this ever goes to trial, you'll lose. Because at the end of the day, you have nothing. Have a nice flight. There is some serious bad blood between these two men. So they successfully fight off IBM and their posse of lawyers and they're down to the business of making a computer. Yay! Now there are some rules that they have to follow to keep within the letter of the law and avoid jail. Gordon and Cameron can't interact while Cameron writes the BIOS, and Cameron has to stay in the clean room. So, what is it that y'all are doing for us again? Writing BIOS code. It's basic input-output software is what first runs when you turn the computer on. So, like WordStar. So, BIOS boots the computer, which allows you to load the operating system, and then you can run word star. I really like this character. I call her the Deb. She gets the best line in the show. It's right here. So I can write a little love letter to my boyfriend? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. That's right, Cameron. Computers aren't the thing. They're what gets you to the thing. Namely, connecting with other actual human beings. You could learn something from Deb. Joe makes an impassioned speech where he quotes Steve Jobs without citing him. We just might put a ding in the universe, right? And Cameron calls him out on that. That shit won't fly with Cameron. <laughs> I mean, I thought maybe Joe figured that everyone at a software company would know who he was quoting when he quoted Steve Jobs, but yeah, Cameron, you got him, yes sir. Look, I don't think you appreciate the opportunity we have here. Mm. I heard all about it. Have fun, make money. And then a whole bunch of other shit that you either made up entirely or stole from someone else. You're just a salesman. Joe, not sending your sources. Jail's too good for you. 
This exchange shows part of the reason why most people think Joe is a sociopath. They do it in part based on Cameron's paranoid reactions to relatively normal behavior by, well, any man in her presence. Once again, a woman is defining the intentions of a man by her reaction to his actions. We conclude Joe is a sociopath based on the following totally heinous things that he does. He didn't cite his source that one time. He tells white lies about a part of his life that's painful. <gasps> he hired a person with actual management experience over a person with no management experience who actively abuses and humiliates coworkers. He didn't send a person who had previously screwed up several important sales to a sales conference. He bluffed his way into a job at Cardiff, and no one ever in the history of business has ever bluffed or lied their way into a job, and then subsequently wrote a biography in which they bragged about it. Mm, well, the man is a monster. And he played a mean-spirited prank on a rapist. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Because Joe is the agency sink, we judge him not on the actual actions he takes, but solely on their effect on characters we think are more sympathetic, or have more of an internal life, or any internal life, or any emotions at all, namely Cameron and possibly Gordon. In fact, if Joe takes an action to benefit Cameron at the expense of Gordon, we damn him for it, even though we would damn him if he took the action to benefit Gordon instead of Cameron. No matter what, Joe does. He's damned. That's what it means to be an agency sink, folks. And what's the exact opposite of an agency sink? <laughs> Cameron. No consequences apply to her. Ever. But since I don't like that, see this? This is my Cameron should be fired counter. So let's begin. It's not long before Cameron, free-spirited scamp that she is, manages to flout the rules. Next morning, Cameron's no longer in the clean room. Where could she be? Joe tracks her down to the basement. This is an interesting moment. Joe quietly observes Cameron before making a show of intimidation. Sort of suggests the show of intimidation is just that. A show. He then reads her the riot act, which makes him a horrible person or something. It occurs to me that you think you can do whatever you want here. This isn't your playground. Incidentally, that tally? Humiliating co-workers, putting the company in legal jeopardy, abusing your boss. You practice that in a mirror? And that's just her first one and a half days on the job, folks. She responds by insulting him a bit more, and Joe, using his X-Men powers of empathy, figures out she's stuck. You're stuck. Do you even know what you're trying to do? What? Like, you know? Actually, this is the one really completely unbelievable thing about this show. Joe has... She, he has, like, Xavier or Emma Frost or... I don't know phonics level of frickin' empathy. It's insane. <sighs> anyway, she responds by insulting him a bit more, and, and here's where Halt and Catch Fire switches gears from a light drama to a horror film. I didn't pick up what happened during Cameron and Joe's confrontation in the basement till I had watched it twice. The first time I'd watched this episode, I did notice another invisible gorilla waltzing through the set. Prior to the scene, Joe has a big stupid grin on his face every time he sees Cameron. After this scene, you don't see that smile again for a long time. I noticed that and was somewhat baffled at the stark change in his demeanor towards her. So I rewatched this episode, looking for the answer. First, let's look at all the clues. Here's one. This bathroom scene is immediately after the confrontation in the basement for Cameron. The first time I watched this episode, I wonder why Cameron would change her shirt and brush her teeth in the middle of the day. I thought it was a sloppy way of getting her to interact with Donna. But this is a clue to what took place in the basement. She's changing her shirt because she got something on it, and she's brushing her teeth to get a taste out of her mouth. Deodorant? I guess she just got sweaty for some reason. And now here's another clue. While Cameron and Joe were in the basement, 
Gordon is going through Cameron's stuff. Butterfly knives were illegal in Texas in 1983, and the reason why is, like switchblades, they are easily concealable and rapidly deployable. That means you can just be standing around and suddenly have a six-inch knife at your throat. In other words, this knife is illegal because people don't see it coming. Interesting symbolism for what's going on in the basement between Cameron and Joe right at this moment. Here's another clue. The direct aftermath of the confrontation between Cameron and Joe in the basement. I'll state for the record again that we know nothing about that girl or what she's capable of. You're right. Once she writes the bios code, we should cut her loose. A lot of people accuse Joe of betraying Cameron here. So far, no one has asked why he suddenly and inexplicably wants to get rid of her. Well, of course, he's a sociopath, right? Sort of comes out of nowhere since it's the first time Joe mentioned it. Just like changing from grinning like a loon when she's around to looking hunted is a bit sudden, too. So let's rewind. Note how Joe is hunched over in the elevator. A big change from his usual body posture. Also notice that he sweeps back his hair with his hands. This is actually a nervous gesture for him. He does it again when he's confronted by the police, later on in the series. Listen for the second time Joe says that they should cut her loose after she finishes the BIOS. His voice trembles when he says BIOS and any more. What do you mean? As soon as she finishes the BIOS code, there's no more legal threat. We don't need her anymore. Then when he turns the corner and Gordon can't see him, he looks like he's been punched in the gut. Oh. Well, okay. Well, yeah. He recovers a bit here. He pulls on the mask of a confident, domineering businessman in order to hide the truth that he's bleeding from being stabbed by that butterfly knife. Metaphorically speaking. Right now we need her in the clean room. Then you go down and talk to her. I'm not even supposed to be on the same floor as her. Look, if she's not at her desk and putting keystrokes, then she's not writing bios code. Okay, we need her... Right Look at Joe's face. That's fear. He's terrified to go down there again. Joe eventually agrees to do what Gordon says, but not before Gordon gets weirded out by Joe's reaction. Okay. So whatever happened between Cameron and Joe, it was emotionally devastating to Joe, and he was scared to go down again. Whatever happened resulted in Cameron getting something on a shirt and a burning desire to brush her teeth. And finally, the creative team chose to symbolize it with the discovery of Cameron possessing an illegal knife. Now let's look at the scene itself. Maybe I can help. What are you doing? I don't want to think about this anymore. You need to go upstairs, get back to your terminal. So, are we going to do this or what? The way this scene plays out, it's obvious that Cameron is giving Joe no other options to control her behavior or get her to do her work than submit to her sexual advances. And need I remind you that right now her behavior is putting him and Cardiff in legal jeopardy and also he needs her to do that work or he may be facing jail. She raped him. Specifically she forced oral sex on him. Now feminists would categorically call that rape. Other people might disagree. Cameron can leave whenever she wants. That's what this scene establishes. She's not facing jail unless she opens the BIOS. And IBM even goes so far as to offer her a job. So she's not in the same situation that he is in. He's trapped, and she's cornered him. I'm going to have to create a new tally just to encompass the sheer scope of Cameron's bastardry. This is the Cameron should have gone to jail tally. And I'm going to use the just world standard. In a just world, Cameron should have gone to jail for raping Joe. Dude! I don't need.
need your help right now. Look, I need this to be what I need it to be, not what you want it to be. What's interesting about this scene, this specific scene, is that it's a callback to when Joe and Cameron had sex originally. They're both occurring in the same kind of area, a storage space that's poorly lit. And this... Come on! Let's get in the game! I... This is specifically a callback to when Cameron rejects Joe. You mean we're not in love? <laughs> in fact, I think they use a very, almost the same sound effect in this in both scenes. In the original scene, Cameron is rejecting Joe because she misunderstood his invitation to a greater emotional intimacy via humor. In this scene, Joe is rejecting Cameron. If he can get her to program the BIOS this way, he doesn't need to actually submit to her sexual abuse because she won't get stuck. So he's essentially saying no. And what's Doubly interesting is the situation that Cameron is putting him in is one where she has removed all human intimacy, even the most basic, even the kind you would see in a one night stand. And that basic human intimacy is the recognition that, of your partner's autonomy, of their right to, to consent or not consent. She's stripped that away. She's, she's not treating Joe like an autonomous person. She's treating Joe like a machine that she turns on and off when she needs it. And the other thing about this scene, which I noticed the first time I watched it, are there are moments when you can see that Joe, there's something wrong with Joe. I don't mean that he's angry, that he is either in pain or afraid or something. It's very disturbing. Incidentally, at this point in time, after she does this to him, which he obviously really does not want, he really starts to unravel and lose his shit. And this is just the beginning. If being raped by Cameron wasn't enough of a bad day for Joe, IBM or most likely Dale, considering his position at IBM as VP of Sales for North America, initiates a raid on Cardiff's client base. What the hell is going on? That is actually the phone. Get him John, back. We're being raided. Back on the line. IBM is undercutting us by 300 grand. Get him on the phone. Uh, uh, hold on. We've lost American Airlines, Texas Com, Club Sys, EDS, General Dynamics, and seven others. Let me help. You've been here ten days, for God's sake. I know this business. Son, this is about relationships. It's something you wouldn't understand. You're talking back. Get out of my way. Yeah. Fifteen accounts lost, the top three of which represent 68% of our core billings. This raid means that Cardiff will be out of business in a little under two months, which further means that they will have to lay off half the staff of Cardiff to stay afloat. Wow. Tell me you have a plan, Joe. Wow. Wow. You were just pretending. But before we pile all the blame onto Joe, here's some background to this event you may have overlooked. Boz hired Joe without checking his references or even asking for a resume, all on the strength of the commissions in one paycheck, which if he had examined closely, he would have realized was dated a year and a half before Joe walked through the door. Either Boz is insane or desperate. You come next week, half those people out there are going to be out of a job. Out on the street. Geez, Boz, you should have thought of that before you put Cardiff in a position where hiring a man who swanned in from nowhere made any sense at all. We all blame Joe for this, including Joe. But there are men here who are not taking their fair share of responsibility for this fallout. Cardiff was circling down the drain because of a combination of Boz not being current in his industry and Nathan not caring about the future of his company. From where I'm sitting, connecting all the dots, Joe came into a company that was about to be flushed and saved everyone who could be saved. And he still felt responsible because he couldn't save them all. These people were dead men walking before Joe even came to Cardiff. They would have been laid off eventually when Cardiff went bankrupt or Nathan decided to sell to a competitor. 